Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, good day and good afternoon to you. It's another edition of Mom at Home. Uh, my name is BJ Morgan. I am the marketing manager for the Museum of Making Music. Uh, it's a hot one out there today. Uh, we were just briefly talking about the weather, and uh, I, you know, I looked at the forecast here. It's 104 degrees in Temecula. I love it. Uh, it's good uh, good winemaking weather. That's We're famous for wine up here in Temecula. Uh, Carlsbad, I don't know what the weather's like on the coast, but I see... Already, Brian uh, in the chat has mentioned it's a hot Friday. Yes, uh, heat wave here in uh, Southern California. Uh, Joe, Inland Empire, I got you. I'm right there, 108 degrees. Uh, it's amazing, though. Uh, I've got the uh, home studio cooled off. I put on the blue lights so it feels a little cooler in here. Today, uh, I'm very excited about today. Um, we actually have two guests today. Mr. Bill is not with us today. Instead, instead, um, we have what I believe is the perfect pairing. Uh, Allison Brown is a... a world-renowned banjo player, but let me introduce um, George Varga, first of all, because he's going to be our uh, interviewer for today, uh, and then he's going to be introducing the star of the show, Allison. So George, if you don't know George Varga, he's a veteran of the San Diego Union Tribune. He's the pop music critic there. He is also a fellow drummer. Uh, he started drumming in rock bands at the age of 12, and then he began writing professionally at, about music at 15. Originally from Louisiana, he spent some time in Germany. Uh, George has earned three Pulitzer Prize nominations for his writing at the Union Tribune. He's a voting member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, he provides live coverage of the Grammy Awards, festivals from Coachella, Caboo, and the 1994 edition of Woodstock. Uh, man, his interview rap sheet is miles long just renowned people uh, including Alice and this isn't the first time they've uh, spent time together but uh, it ranges from uh, Ray Charles Miles Davis Britney Spears Willie Nelson Kanye West Bruno Mars on and on and on if you haven't had opportunity to read George's work check it out uh, he's a, a prolific writer uh, friend of music uh, has always been a, a, a good reliance from the Museum of Making Music whenever we uh, ask him to come and help he has uh, helped us out in many situations and this is a, another example of George uh, joining us for a very special project that is near and dear to our, our hearts he's here today as our guest interviewer for Allison Brown and let me talk about Allison Brown for a little bit uh, she is one of the most multifaceted minds of roots music she is a Grammy winning musician producer for former investment banker, which I didn't realize that until I read uh, her bio. That's awesome. Uh, and she's all the co-founder co of the internationally acclaimed Nashville-based Compass Rep Records Group. They're celebrating their 21st 25th anniversary this year. Uh, she's got they've got a catalog of thousands of titles, uh, four label imprints. Compass Records has been described by Billboard magazine as one of the greatest independent labels of the last decade. Um, and then although Allison began her musical career as a member of Allison Krauss and Union Station, it is through her solo recordings and composition that she's built a reputation as one of today's most innovative banjo players. She's known for taking the instrument far beyond its Appalachian roots by blending bluegrass, jazz influence and a sonic tapestry that has earned praise and recognition from a variety of national tastemakers, including the Wall Street Journal, CBS Sunday Morning, NPR, one of my favorites, and USA Today. Uh, she's released 11 solo albums, earning four Grammy nominations, a Grammy Award for Best Country Instrumental Performance in 2000, and the International Bluegrass Music Association, the IBMA, Banjo Player of the Year Award. Man, that's an amazing portfolio of work. Uh, she's a producer of note. Credits include seven Grammy-nominated bluegrass albums. Take some time. I, I just There's too much to talk about in Allison, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to George and Allison right now, and they're going to discuss her career, every, all the work she's done, the connection with her instrument today. And um, I invite our guests today who are joining us online. If you've got questions, comments, I'm, I'm going to pop in and, and uh, relate those to our two guests today. George, Allison, thank you for joining us today. I uh, welcome you to Mom at Home. Thank you. Hey, Allison, it's an honor to, uh, to interview you um, again. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are the only Grammy Award winning banjo player um, record company head and band leader who is a graduate of La Jolla High School, Harvard, and UCLA. Um, and uh, the, the really unique factor there, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, not only did you, did you study at Harvard, but you have been studied at Harvard. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that for a moment. 
because um, I think that ties in with, with your your music and MBA and, and bringing them together, maybe. Well, first of all, George, you know, I'm a huge fan of yours, and it's always a great honor to get to talk to you. Um, I think if you add enough descriptors to anybody's anybody's uh, CV, you can be the only one in the world of that type. But um, yeah, it's it's all everything that you said is is spot on. So um, I recall from a 2010 interview I did with your dad that you were playing up in the Bay Area at the annual Hardly Stickly Bluegrass Festival, and a lady came up to him from Harvard and said that they were studying you. Um, and I'm wondering if you remember that and why, I, I know you're an alum of Harvard, but why did you then become a matter of, uh, or a topic of study for Harvard? Yeah, well, it's funny because a lot of things, I mean, the banjo has been a gift to me in many ways. And one is, when one way is the people that it's put me in connection with. And um, the person that, that maybe my dad mentioned and that you're referring to is Teresa Amabile. She was a professor at the Harvard Business School. And her husband, Steve, is a banjo player. So that's how she became aware of what I was doing. So she um, was actually, her specialty was uh, creativity within the business world. So um, creativity and entrepreneurship. So she wrote a case study about Compass Records for her class. And we actually, Gary West, my husband and co-founder of the label, he and I had a chance to go up to Harvard Business School and like defend our case with the business school class. <laughs> it was, it's really, it was really very, very cool. And did you defend it with or without a banjo? <laughs> well, you know, um, without a banjo. And it was funny because the class's consensus was that Allison was going to really have to make a decision between whether or not she wanted to run a business or play the banjo. And it's funny because to me, the whole point of our company has been that we're creatives, we're artists ourselves, who are trying to build a lifestyle in music. And when we conceived of the idea for, for Compass, it was part of uh, one of many spokes of a wheel of like how to build a life in music. So for me, playing music and running a record label are two things that um, in some inexplicable way really do complement each other. And I really, it's hard for me to imagine honestly doing one without the other. Um, you were, I'm working from memory, but you were born in Connecticut, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then you moved to, with your family to La Jolla when you were 16, I believe? I was actually uh, nearly 12 and just about to start okay. middle school at La Jolla, um, Maryland's high, junior high. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. So um, I know that you had an early epiphany when you heard Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Did that happen before you moved out here from Connecticut or after? And can you kind of recount how you heard it and, and how it affected you? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I, w I was uh, I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, and my parents got really into guitar in the early 70s. And they were taking guitar lessons from a fellow who was also a law student, and he also played banjo. So eventually I started taking guitar lessons from him, and he gave me the uh, the Foggy Mountain banjo record. And that's where I first heard Earl Scruggs. And actually my dad made a cassette tape of that album for me um, and labeled it Hillbilly Music. And it just um, blew me away. And I, I don't really know why the sound called to me as it, as it did and as it still does, but that was kind of my epiphany. It's just like the best sound. So I started playing banjo when I was, I guess really started playing when I was about 10, but it wasn't until we moved to San Diego when I was just about to turn 12 that I connected with the San Diego Bluegrass Club and found other people who were playing this music and really got into it. Did connecting with that club and bluegrass entail eating a lot of pizza? <laughs> um, not as much as one might think, <laughs> but it did entail standing in um, the parking lot a lot and jamming. And that was really the best part, you know. The parking lot where? At the parking lot at the Shakey's Pizza Palace in La Mesa, which is where the Bluegrass Club met. And um, it's funny because people who grow up playing um, bluegrass music in California are like pizza and bluegrass. But people who grow up in, in this in the Appalachian states don't have that same experience. It's very, um, very much just a California thing. Yeah, I know that the, the three members of Nickel Creek also came up uh, at a pizza parlor in North County. Um, so you, you hear Foggy Mountain Breakdown, you have the epiphany, you get a banjo. Foggy Mountain Breakdown would probably be a pretty difficult beginning number to learn. Um, what did you begin playing when you took up the banjo? 
Um, well, I started with Scrugg style and I've been playing finger pick guitar. So the idea of like picking was pretty natural to me, but what wasn't natural was having to wear metal picks on my fingers mm. and, and the thumb pick. And so that was something that really uh, was hard to get used to. The first tune my teacher taught me was Cripple Creek, which is a classic Earl Scruggs tune and, you know, incorporates like the, the forward roll that Earl Scruggs invented, which is like the cornerstone of the bluegrass sound. <laughs> where it all starts with three finger style bluegrass banjo. Um, when you were 16, which would have put you probably in 10th grade, you won the Canadian National Banjo Championship. Um, so I'm curious, uh, what was that like? What, what, I don't know if you recall what you played to win that, but um, were you an anomaly in terms of being a 16 year old American kid in this Canadian contest? And how were you welcomed with open arms or who's, who's the infiltrator or? Okay, so a lot of questions there. Um, first of all, I, I heard about the Canadian National Banjo Championship and I thought that it would look really good on my college application. <laughs> and I was very fortunate to be traveling around the United States with Stuart Duncan, who's the amazing fiddle player who grew up in Vista for part of his childhood and um, is like the cat on the fiddle in, in, in a lot of genres right now. He lives in Nashville also. But his dad was a retired Marine and was taking us around the country to go to different bluegrass festivals so we could see what bluegrass was like in other parts of the country. He drove us up to Canada for that competition and I remember um, playing CJ's Breakdown, which was a tune that was written by Carl Jackson. And uh, the reason I played it is because it was the opening theme music for KSON's Bluegrass Special, which is hosted by Wayne Rice and is the oldest running bluegrass radio show in the country at this point, I think celebrating 45 years this year. And that's right here in San Diego, Wayne. Yeah, right there in San Diego. So. It kind of was a, a connection back to my San Diego roots. And was I anomaly? Yes. Um, but it was it was the first time I'd ever been to Canada. And I just remember everybody would be like, have a tune, eh? And it's like, who <laughs> are these people? I'd never been to Canada before. But it was awesome. I mean, you know, Canadians are the nicest people in the world. So it was one of my one of my first fond memories of Canada. Now, could you play a little, if you remember it, of that winning uh, uh, <laughs> He said you did. Oh yeah, this might really suck, but nice melodic runs to it, which I always really love. So you come back from Canada, you've won the uh, Canadian National Banjo Championship. I can only assume that that gave you a lot of credibility at La Jolla High School. <laughs> well, that combined with my um, passion for Star Trek, um, yes, made me one of the probably least popular people at La Jolla High School. <laughs> um, did the fact that you were, and I'm making a wild guess, the only banjo player at La Jolla High, never mind the only international award-winning banjo player at La Jolla High, did that make you, going back to being an anomaly, did it make you more determined to continue to do that even though nobody in your high school was doing that? And I'm going to stereotype there weren't a lot of bluegrass fans among your fellow student body, um, the analogy I might make would be if you're, well, when I was in, in 10th grade and became a jazz fan, I could find very few people uh, in my peer group who, who were at that point, and then later on I, I found them. So I'm wondering um, if, if indeed you were kind of one of a kind there, did that make it easier or more difficult? Did it make you more determined to 
continue even though people really didn't connect with what you were devoting your time to? Well, you know, it was probably the same for you. I kind of, I, as I recall, it's kind of like you have parallel lives. One is your life at high school where you're kind of like doing what kids do in high school. And the other for me was going off on the weekends and getting to play bluegrass music a lot of times in different bands with Stuart. So it was wonderful to have someone who was kind of my age to, you know, write ridiculous tunes like Possum Gravy and Grandma's Beard or something with and have them th also think that that was funny. Um, yeah, and there was a lot going on in Southern California for bluegrass at the time, probably even more than there is now. So I'd go up to L.A. a lot on the weekends and we'd play, you know, at the Ice House or the Troubadour or the Banjo Cafe or the Palomino Club or, you know, there are uh, festivals and even gigs and restaurants that don't like really exist anymore, like those steak and ale kind of restaurant gigs where bands would be like regular fixtures hmm. that we get to do. So, you know, they... I don't think I was really looking to my classmates for encouragement to continue doing what I was doing. It's just such a passion for me, you know, that it was never really a question about caring whether or not they thought it was cool. And I was just generally so uncool that just throw the banjo on top of that, it really didn't make too much difference. Um, we referenced uh, Stuart Duncan, who, um, if not for the pandemic, would have been performing here in August with uh, Goat Rodeo, the great group with Yo-Yo uh, Ma, Chris Keeley, and Edgar Meyer. Uh, and uh, Stuart has, I think he performed here with uh, Robert Plant and Alison Krauss uh, a number of years ago. Um, so just wanted to refer people to, to that. Um, you are the only member of your family who did not become a lawyer. Um, did, uh, do you have, I'm wondering, going, pivoting over to Compass Records and, and the fact that you have an MBA, um, are they two worlds that you bring together by embodying them both, or do you put on one cap for one and one for the other? Because the stereotype might be that what can make for a really gifted musician like you could be almost diametrically different than what would make for a really good uh, record company head, and you're both. And so I'm wondering, do they totally blur or do you, are they compartmentalized? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think that maybe I'm more pragmatic than, than a lot of musicians might be. It's like for me, when I think about creating music, it's, I've, it's okay for me for the creation to be informed by the market. You know, like what are the challenges in the music industry at the moment? And what are the best ways to position your music to succeed in that environment? rather than just being like a creative and it's like, oh, I'm going to write the tunes I'm going to write and do it. And I don't really care what happens beyond that. I think you need to have a little bit of that. But for me, I also need to have a big dose of, and how do we position it in the marketplace? So it stands the greatest chance of success because I think at the end of the day, people do want to see their art be recognized and, and heard. And when I produce records, that kind of idea of designing an outcome is a big part of what I encourage other artists to think about. It's like at the end of the day, at the end of this process and the record's been out for six months, what are the things you want to have seen happen to for your music? And if we can decide those things now, then we can make sure that we create a record that has the chance of succeeding in those ways. So for me, it's kind of natural to like do like do the creative part, but then also think about the business part too. And it's hard to do them at the same time. And sometimes knowing too much about the business side makes me feel like, uh, you know, really why do we need to have more music if there's too much music coming out? What's the point of creating more music? But that's the part where your drive to create, it's just an important thing for you to do. So you have to do it, you have to keep moving forward. But I don't think that it really impedes your art by also taking into consideration the challenges in the marketplace. So having your business background do you have a manager or are you as a performer or are you your own manager? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, we don't have a manager. We pretty much self-manage uh, just because we found that we know so much about this stuff. But if we, if we did find the right person who could kind of bring knowledge that we don't have, we would certainly go in that direction. Hmm. Right. A moment ago, uh, we mentioned Stuart Duncan having performed here in San Diego with Alison Krauss and Robert Plant. And I believe in 1991, you joined Alison Krauss's band. Um, and I, 
correct me if I'm wrong, while you were well known to fans of the banjo and in, in, in bluegrass, it, it would appear to me that that kind of elevated your visibility, uh, but I'm making that assumption from afar. So if, if that was indeed a pivotal uh, point in, in your evolution, could you talk about that for a moment? Sure, yeah, completely. I actually joined her band in 89, and I had oh. stopped being an investment banker in 1988. So really, I, I, don't, I think if people were aware of me, it would only be those few people who had a copy of pre-sequel, which is the record Stuart and I made um, that came out on Ridge Runner Records, you know, right after we graduated from high school, around 1981, uh, early 80s. So yes, it was an incredibly pivotal moment in terms of just like being able to be in a national band and have that profile. But also for me, you know, as a banjo player, like being in a band with people from the states where this music came from and like being like immersed in that culture and getting to ride down I-40 in a van, you know, and that's playing bluegrass music and see a sign that says Pike County or, you know, Cumberland Gap. And you're like, God, this is where the music came from. That's where those, that's where Earl got the song title from. It's, it was really, really, really cool for someone who's really spent most of their time in California or Connecticut. Were there any, any things in particular you took away from being in that band that when you became a band leader yourself, you could apply or not apply? Mm. Well, Allison was, was a, she's a, an amazing artist in many ways, but one of the things I really give her a lot of credit for is knowing who she is as an artist and what she, the music that she wants to sing and, or, and play and how she wants it to appear. Like she's got it all in mind. She's not, swayed by other people's you know by the market too much she knows what she wants to project so in that sense i mean i think maybe one of the takeaways is just trying to feel like you have a really solid idea of what you want your art to be but then leave enough room for other people to bring their voices into into it and in our band that's really critical because a lot of the music that i write has a foot in bluegrass but also has a foot in jazz for some reason that I still am trying to figure out. So it's been my lifelong pursuit to try to have a little bit more credibility when I play that stuff. Hmm. But the guys that I play with are just so skilled at it and it's so natural for them that when we put our music together, it's definitely a very democratic process. If you could compare and contrast when you were a teenager, roughly how often did you practice and for how long? Um, when in 1989, when you joined uh, Allison's band, um, and the difference there that as a teenager, you weren't on the road all the time, presumably. Uh, and today, how much time do you devote to, to practicing? <laughs> yeah, um, so I don't know if my parents are listening in, but they're probably laughing if they are, because I used to practice so much that they would just, after like the fifth or sixth hour, would be like, Allison, please stop playing the banjo. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes I'd go out and sit in my mom's car, you know, just so it wasn't so loud. I mean, even the neighbors were tired of hearing me play the banjo. It was, it was just such an obsession. Um, you know, when I joined Allison's band, it was funny. I spent a lot of time actually living with her family. She was a teenager when I joined her band. And she's still living with her mom and dad and her brother. And so when we had gigs in that part of the country, I'd fly from San Francisco where I was living and stay with her family in Champaign. And we'd sit around a lot, you know, and a lot of what we did was just like sit around and sing songs more, you know, uh, there wasn't so much practicing. And, um, and nowadays, I'm juggling so many balls that I don't get nearly as much time as I would like to have to right. practice banjo. It's like, you know, if it weren't for the pandemic, I'd say I usually only get to practice on the weekends. Because we're at home now, I get to practice a bit more. But I mean, for me, when I start to play banjo, it's just like I look up and it's somehow it's four hours later and I'm like, what? So it's it's something that it's still a huge passion for me just to get to sit down and play. Hmm. I know you've been uh, going through a jazz guitar book and I'm wondering, I don't know if there's something you could play from that. I'm just curious what currently when you when you uh, practice. Oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> if if there's something I could play from it, no, I keep to, I still keep starting back on page three it's you know it's like i feel like when you learn something when you're a kid you kind of progress through the levels of it 
it's like this way for me with learning the Japanese language, which, you know, is just a side pursuit, but just because I love Japan and I love the language, but I can't seem to get past like chapter six somehow because I just don't dedicate myself in a systematic way to it. And also because I kind of know the stuff that's at the beginning, but I don't know it a hundred percent. So um, is there something I could play from it? Not really. It's more, but you know, for me, one of the things that I really love is, is chord melody. And so, and that's what I'm trying to pull out of this book more than like scales. It's just like different chord voicings, you know, cause I love, I love to sit around and play like Stephen Foster tunes. You know? stuff but you know if you play that kind of stuff around most banjo players who are like oh my god you know what are those chords because in bluegrass you just don't think about anything except just like the basic triad chords you know it's like maybe it's a one four five or in the key of g like a g c d chord and maybe there's an a chord in there sometimes, or maybe an e chord in there sometimes or an e minor chord but generally harmonically it's it's pretty much in a box so as soon as right. you start trying to add altered chords in you know it's for banjo players their ears really go up because it's like there's a deep history of that kind of stuff on the banjo maybe not so much with the fifth string but certainly with all the plectrum and tenor guys that do that stuff so beautifully so it's part of the instrument and that's a lot of what i'm trying to dig out of a, of a jazz book you mentioned uh, japan and japanese a moment ago and i remember from one of our prior interviews a number of years ago, that at that point in time, you said there were probably more um, lady banjo players in Japan than America. And having grown up in Europe, I know that, that uh, American music is often embraced almost with more uh, reverence than it is in America, because maybe we take it for granted. But has that shifted at all? Would you say there are, are now more um, more women of any age, but particularly younger women in America who, who are, are getting into the banjo? Yeah, well, I haven't been to Japan in a few years, um, but I think that it's very likely like that we've kind of, I, f I feel like with female musicians and bluegrass music in general, we've really kind of hit that tipping point. But I was really so happy to see that, I think it's three, or maybe four of the nominees for Banjo Player of the Year out of five are female. That's like, that's huge hmm. because it was really only just a couple of years ago that a female had won every instrumental category except for Dobro Player of the Year, which kind of led to the First Ladies of Bluegrass. But in coming blue, back blue. to your question, yeah, yeah. it's like, I definitely feel like the tide is turning. And I think a lot of that is, you know, I mean, I've been playing for a long time. Kristen Scott Benson who's won Banjo Player of the Year now, I don't know, half a dozen times probably, is a great player. And, you know, she's been a role model too. So there've been like maybe enough of a line of us at this point to try to encourage there to be more women playing the banjo, especially girls. Um, you were a member of the uh, First Ladies of Bluegrass along with Molly Tuttle, Sierra Hall. Could, could you tell people about that group? Sure, absolutely. So I was, um, you know, it's it's a great joy to get to play music with women and as a female it's like especially in bluegrass you know growing up it would just kind of seem like i spent probably as much time with middle-aged men as i did with people my own age because that's who was in the bands you know that's who was playing bluegrass music and so i was producing a missy rain's relatively new record that's called royal traveler she's a great bass player and ibma bass player of the year eight plus times probably and we were trying to figure out who would be great to bring in to sing a, a song called Swept Away that Missy wanted to do. It's a song that was written by Lori Lewis. And Lori, of course, was a member of the Good Old Persons, which was probably one of the first bands that was like, had even like greater than gender parity because it was a five piece band with three women in it. And that was in the 70s. So that was really unusual then. And since Lori wrote the song, I thought it'd be cool to have put together a female band. And as I started to think about it, I realized that we almost had a full complement of IBMA instrumentalists, except for guitar player. And Molly had been nominated that year and she was, you know, I mean, this was August and she was went on to win it in September. 
So that was really how that band came together is just kind of that realization that we finally did have a band and we've played a couple festivals together and, and things. And it's, it's been, um, it's really special because when you get to interact with other women, it's just, you get this, these other points of connection that you don't have when you play with men. For example, like if you could see my phone text thread, you'd see that like the first ladies of bluegrass have been swapping recipes a lot for the last couple of months. And that's, you know, that's something that feels very natural for us to do. The other thing that's really interesting about First Ladies that I didn't expect is the audience reaction, which isn't so much, wow, those guys can really shred or whatever. Um, it's really just seeing people who are in tears watching this, um, because I just think it's kind of this affirmation of some aspect of, you know, like the human spirit or what we can do when we lock arms and move forward together and inspire the next generation. There's there's something else at work that's was has been very surprising but very gratifying to see. Um, I I look behind you and it looks like a beautiful day, but you before we went live, you told me you, you've had uh, kind of thunderous uh, weather as well, and uh, really awkward segue into fair weather an album you made <laughs> ago that will be uh, having a twentieth anniversary edition in August, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So the record, yeah, and somehow unbelievably came out 20 years and two kids ago. Um, but when it came out, people weren't doing vinyl releases. And as part of Compass Records 25th anniversary celebration this year, we've been re-releasing certain kind of classic records from our catalog on vinyl. So yeah, we've put Fairweather out on vinyl for the first time. It's coming out in August. Will there be any new, new quote, new old material on it or? No, you know, we didn't have really any like stuff like that to put on it. So really it's just, it's purely, it's not even a reissue because it was never out of print. So I've been calling it, it's a vinyl virgin release. <laughs> um, the growth of Compass Records over the past 25 years has been pretty remarkable. And I, I think there are nearly a dozen or maybe more than a dozen labels that, that are under the umbrella of Compass that you distribute, is that correct? Uh, maybe not quite that many, but certainly a, a handful for sure. And um, the the breadth of people uh, who fall under that umbrella, everybody from Fairport Convention, the pioneering uh, folk rock band from England, and I, I think Clive Gregson might have done an album for you. And then from San Diego, AJ Croce and Steve Pulps have been yeah. Uh, under that umbrella as well. Um, when you co-founded Compass with your husband, what was the vision then? And and I, maybe you you were thinking that far ahead to 25 years from now, we'll have put out, I think what 700 albums now or more. Um, but but talk about what what the original idea was and then how it evolved from there. Right. So you have to like go back through the mists of time to the early 1990s. Um, cause it was before the DIY do it yourself artist thing really blossomed. And we, we just thought, well, it doesn't really make sense for people who are suits to be running a music company. So we were dealing with um, some record labels at the time that were, you know, purely run by people who weren't musicians themselves, hadn't been on the road and didn't really seem to be that in touch with what musicians and artists deal with. And we thought it made all the sense in the world for musicians and, run a record label. So we didn't really know anything. That was just the conjecture. So we were out touring and we'd see some great musician or be over in the UK and see someone like Kate Rusby. And we're like, gosh, that person's awesome. It would be great to help elevate their profile so that more people could be aware of their music. And that was really the impetus. And we certainly weren't looking 25 years ahead. I mean, who could have imagined all the changes that the shape of the industry has taken over those 25 years mm. too? But that was that was it. That's kind of how we started. So we sitting at the kitchen table, knowing nothing about really how you do it. We had um, met an Australian company when we were touring with Michelle Schacht in 1992. And we just bought their didgeridoo album from this guy, Alan Dargan, who is an incredible player, like amazing. But it's like a didgeridoo record and it blew us away. So we reached out to the label and it was these two brothers and we had dinner with them a couple times and like second night, they were like, uh, well, you guys want to start a record label. Why don't you distribute our catalog in the United States? So that's 
sort of how we launched the business and then we launched the compass imprint just a little bit after that. But the first thing we ever released in the U S was a didgeridoo record. So you would never have thought we could make it 25 years at that start. (laughs) (laughs) And even though we're regrettably in the middle of a pandemic, compass has already put out half a dozen albums in 2020. Mm -hmm. Is that harder to do in terms of, I, I don't know if they're, coming out in in multiple formats that is not only online, but also in vinyl, on vinyl or in other, any other form. But h- how is the pandemic impacting? The fact that you put out half a dozen, it's pretty impressive to me, but I don't know how yeah. difficult it may have been to, to do that. Right. So most of the time in the record business, you're thinking like 16 weeks ahead of where you actually are, because we found best practices are, you know, kind of a 16 week plan. Um, you you know, lead time is like really key to success and getting the word out about things. So when the pandemic hit in March, we had some records that had been teed up to go and it really didn't make sense to hold them back because they, even though they weren't out, like uh, David Bromberg has a great record called Big Road. That's one of those. It was like the press effort had been like two months underway and, you know, we were almost at to street date and Eliza Gilkinson record was the same deal and a few others. So there were some that didn't make any sense to stop. And then there were a couple others where we paused for a minute, try to figure out what to do, and then just really decided that we needed to try to keep moving forward with them. And the hardest thing really, obviously nobody's touring, and that's um, that's terrible for the artists, but it also the label, it's hard for the label too, because we're missing all those venue sales that, you know, artists buying the records to resell to their fans at the gig. So that that part's a drag, but we're seeing CD consumption maybe go up a little bit. I think with people being home, um, buying more CDs and streaming, maybe a slight uptick too. It's nothing that's going to compensate for the loss in venue sales. But, you know, it, it has we haven't it hasn't been falling off a cliff the same way it has for people who re- rely completely on touring for their income. I'm glad to hear that. Um, one of the, the great American musicians, um, I think you have a, a, a deep connection with, would be John Hartford. Um, and I know that you've, you've done his song, Gentle on My Mind. And I can't tell, but I think maybe the banjo you have in your lap is also connected to him. And if it is a banjo, I'm thinking of it, it's made by Deering Banjos here in uh, in San Diego. So if you could connect all of that for me. Sure. Um, actually, I'm holding a banjo that was made in the great state of Prague in the Czech Republic. Yeah, <laughs> um, yes, it's my regular G banjo, but my low banjo is just right over there. I can grab it. Um, but uh, yes, I am a huge fan of John's. I regret that I hadn't been a little bit older when I knew him just so that I could really have appreciated him even more deeply. But for some reason, I almost feel it closer to him since he passed away, which was, was is that about 14 years ago, 20 years ago? It's been a good while. Mm. Um, one of the things I love about John is he was a banjo player who wasn't afraid to stop. Like a lot of banjo players, they wind up their right hand and then the song starts and they don't stop doing that until the song's over. But John always left space in his music. The other thing is that he had this signature sound uh, with his banjo and that's because he tuned his banjo down. Like this banjo is tuned to a G chord, but John would tune his banjo down uh, a whole step or a step and a half so that it would be an E chord or an F chord because he had a low voice. And so that way he could play like the open roll stuff while he sang rather than having to just be stuck playing closed position chords that don't ring as well. So whenever you hear a low banjo, it's like for me, it like says John Hartford without the words even being spoken. So when I, and I found that I was using that instrument a lot on sessions. Like if you go in to do a, if you go in to do a bluegrass session, it's one thing like this kind of banjo is probably going to give you everything you need, but you know, if I go in to play on an Indigo Girls record, for example, I bring all my banjos because then you're trying to fit a banjo into a, a pop context. And so you need to give like options, like you have to have a palette of sounds. And the low banjo, one of the great things about it is that it really sits in a track well. It doesn't have that kind of high pinging thing quite as much because it's tuned lower. 
So I've, oh, and my able bodies assistant has moved <laughs> over from the couch. So let's pick it up. Thank you, Gary. And I'll show you what I mean. I'll see if it's in tune. <laughs> So I don't know if you can hear the difference between that sound and that sound. So it's got this nice warm thing and if you just roll in the track, it'll sit a lot better. Hmm. So that's a, a long way around telling you guys that, um, that I got a Deering low banjo um, because I was traveling and I wanted to be able to take the low banjo with me, but I was afraid to take this banjo, which is John Hartford's Deering prototype low banjo that I'm very fortunate to have. And, uh, whoops. This still has John's DNA on it. Oh, wow. Very special. <laughs> So anyways, I was afraid to take this banjo on the road, so I got a banjo from Deering that was a good banjo, but I thought there would be some ways that we might be able to improve it, so I reached out to uh, the Deerings, and they're like, yeah, let's collaborate on an instrument. So that turned into the Julia Bell banjo. And that's the other low banjo that I just played. And one of the things that's so cool about it is that I was able to work with Katie Hogue, John's daughter, who lives here in Nashville. And she opened up um, the archives so that I could look at all of John's artwork because he was a schooled artist. And I picked out my favorite inlays, and those are going to be impossible to see. But So John's art is represented in the inlays on this banjo. And you might be able to see the peg head of the girl. And that started off as a line drawing that was on uh, one of the back of one of his albums, and um, Jamie had Jamie Deering had the great idea of colorizing it, so hmm. this became the Julia. And do I, rec do I recall there's a, a riverboat connection because he didn't he pilot a riverboat, uh, and that translated to the artwork. Right. So the Julia Bell Swain was the riverboat that he learned how to pilot, and the guy who taught him was Captain Tron, and I don't know if you can see him. But he's the inlay on the third fret. So maybe you can see. Mm -hmm. That's John's sketch of him. So the banjo really is kind of a an homage to John. That's that's amazing. I, I know that that yeah. online um well I, I, I viewed one earlier, uh you do master classes and I'm I'm curious, um regardless of of the ability of whoever you're, you're um, teaching, whether in person or, or online, um, are there particular musical values that you try to impart to any and everyone that you might uh, be teaching? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, the first thing I like to tell people is a banjo is a great instrument to learn because the first chord's free. And it doesn't matter how you have your banjo tuned. <laughs> open, it's a chord. And so in Western music, uh, you know, two chords will get you a lot of songs and then you just need to learn one more chord and you can play Tom Dooley or a lot of other things. To me, the whole goal of music is to have fun and to share an experience with other people. So I'm always trying to figure out ways to get people past like letting the technical side of the three finger roll stand in the way of their enjoyment of the instrument. And to me, it's like, if all you can do is strum it, that's fine. Because what you need to do is get to the place where you can do it with other people. And there's something very mathematical about a roll that's like a three finger roll against music that's either in two or four, you know what I mean? And it's also very difficult for people to make the leap a lot of times from learning how to play the Scruggs roll, which is that classic Cripple Creek thing I played a little while ago. Like if you learn that or it's like, okay, I can do that, but how do you, how do you get the melody? Like, how do I play a melody and do that at the same time? It's a really hard thing to get people through that spot. Um, but I never want to see that get in the way of their enjoyment of the instrument. So I've tried to think of different ways to break it down. I'm not sure I've figured out the, 
the best way, but you know, if you take a, like even if you can take a tune like You Are My Sunshine. I mean, that's beautiful just like that. If you just go. using the role as an ornament as a way in so i don't know if that was the answer that you were looking for but oh, that was never perfect. Let the technical side get in, in the way of the fun yeah i'm sorry if i i just wanted to interject too you mentioned you know speaking of playing with other people this is another one of those weird segues but we we are with a a, a live audience on our our youtube and our facebook page too and they, they had there's i'm letting the uh the guest questions build up. It, uh, would you uh, be, be uh, okay with uh, answering a few of those? I think kind of this is the perfect time I felt when you're sampling how uh, your technique is. There's some technique related questions, and there's some actually some really interested, interesting uh, like instrument related questions too. You mind if I rattle off a couple of those? Yeah, not at all. Go for it. All right. Let's see, Joe. Uh, this is a banjo. This is actually an instrument related question. I, I don't. Let me see if, if you have a, a, a can can comment on this is the tone of an open back banjo versus a solid back banjo much different is there uh, can you give some insight into that yes it's incredibly different um the resonator on the back of this banjo this part is part of what's making it so loud the mm. other part is the tone ring which is this part in the middle here that's this metal tone ring is also what's giving it its volume. Uh, an open back banjo is a lot quieter instrument and it tends to be thuddier. And a lot of times open back guys and girls will stick a t-shirt in between the coordinator rods inside, hmm. which you could see if you didn't have this back here, you'd see two rods and you put a t-shirt in there to even tamp down the sound even more. Hmm. So yeah, it's a, it's a completely different kind of sound. It's, it's, Sometimes I think it's almost a better place for people to start with the banjo because it's easier to get to that place of enjoying it with other people. Right. Awesome. There you go, Joe. And let's see. Uh, Leon says, I loved your break on that Bobby Osborne, Gotta Get a Letter. Can you discuss how you got about creating banjo breaks to non-traditional tunes? Hmm. That's a good question. First of all, thank you very much for noticing that. That was um, getting to work with Bobby Osborne was amazing in so many ways and he couldn't be a kinder or more generous musical person but um i don't know i think that always the place to start is a melody because you can never go wrong if you play melody and then to me it's like find spots where you're start off saying hey guys i know the melody and here it is i'm going to play a little of it and then just find some lines that connect ideas back to the melody i think that's kind of the way i spin it up i i generally don't think, especially on a vocal song, that it's a good idea to start a solo without saying, hey, I know the melody. I'm not just going to mm. play a bunch of licks. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of the jazz tradition, too. When their jazz musicians start soloing, they'll reflect upon the, the primary theme and then just go off to the races after that. Mm. Uh, let's see. Brian asks, oh, I'm sorry. Brian's got two questions. I'll, I'll start with the more technical question. Um, finger picking guitar is is more about wrapping around chordal forms, but the banjo seems to be more arpeggio-ish. Is that true-ish, he says? Uh, yes-ish. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. I just grabbed a, my able-bodied assistant who's actually doing <laughs> really good this afternoon. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Yeah, that's Gary from Compass Records over there. This is an open back banjo, so you can see the difference. Okay. There's just a lot less of a body, a, a lot less of a chamber for the sound to resonate in, and that's my attempt at a t-shirt. So it's a much quieter sound. Bright, um, brighter, it seems, too. Yeah, probably a little bit brighter, but that may just be this banjo. But then in answer to your question about arpeggios and banjo, yes, it is all about arpeggios. That's what banjo players are doing, mm. is playing pieces of chords a lot. Um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. Good observation, Brian. And his follow-up question, I think this was when you and George were discussing the, the uh, prominence of Japanese banjo players. He uh, observes uh, that the banjo is, uh, the shamis shamisen is very close to the banjo. This is more, I think it's a philosophical question. Do you think that might have something to do with the uh, fact that there's more Japanese women playing the banjo? 
Mm, Mochi rondes. I definitely think so. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a sound that's very familiar. It's like a lot of cultures have a banjo in them, but the shamisen is definitely the one for Japan. And I've had a chance to play with a couple of shamisen players. And uh, yes, the two instruments, they really do go well together. Mm. But the thing about bluegrass music in Japan, it's like there, I don't know, there are 500 people in Japan that are really, really into bluegrass. They're so into it, it makes it seem like they're actually 10,000 people, but they're only 500 people. So I think part of their infatuation with it is just um, their interest in American culture too. And they've somehow discovered this cult of bluegrass music and it appeals to them on a cultural level in addition to the musical level, which is interesting for a, com a country that was occupied, you know? Mm. I think it might be the opposite, but if you talk to the older generation of bluegrass musicians, I'll, most of them will tell you that they got turned on to Flat and Scruggs listening to Armed Forces Radio when they were kids. Yeah. And they found that attractive rather than repellent, which is fascinating. Amazing. All right. I think I have one more for you. One more for you. Uh, a couple of folks that have met and seen you in various places. Douglas says, great meeting you briefly last year at the Americana Fest. Uh, let's see. And then uh, KP Norkin says, saw you at Joe's Pub in New York City four or five years ago. Love the show. But he also asks, is there any chance of a song of the banjo tablature book? Oh, oh, I don't know. It, thank you for so much for asking. Um, I'm like the lamest tab writer in the world, but I think I might have tabbed out Song of the Banjo for Banjo Newsletter. So if that's, um, if that's the case, I would have it. And I'm glad to, you know, share my email or put us in touch if you want to, BJ. And if I've got it, I'd be glad to share the tab. All right. That sounds good. Hey, KP, if you're, if I, it was, that was moments ago that question was asked. So feel free to send the museum an email, museum at museumofmakingmusic.org, and we'll uh, forward that along to Allison. All Great. right. Uh, that, uh, that wraps up our Q&A audience questions, and I'll turn it back over to uh, you, George, for a continuance of our amazing discussion. I'm loving this. I'm just sitting here in the background just enjoying – uh, all this discovery for me. So I, I appreciate both of you uh, taking your time, but I'll turn it back over to you, George. Well, the, the questions from the people that you read were, were so good, they, they could have done the interview. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, Allison, I thought maybe at the end we could, we could uh, conclude with, with you playing whatever you wanted to play. But um, I've always been intrigued by the fact that um, you are rooted in the tradition of the banjo and bluegrass music, and you you broadened that, and you have collaborated with quite a few people, but two that might be unlikely to people who weren't aware of it. Um, you and Kebmo did uh, the Marvin Gaye classic, What's Going On, um, and you and Jake Shimabakuro, the great uh, ukulele virtuoso, did the Chuck Mangione tune, Feels So Good. Um, one wouldn't think of those as being quote unquote banjo numbers. How, I, I assume the reward for you is that they aren't and you adapt, but um, talk about that process of, of taking a song that, that people don't think of in relation to the banjo for the very good reason that they've never heard it uh, on a banjo. And uh, if you could talk about how, how you approach that. Mm -hmm. Well, Song of the Banjo, the goal of that record really was to try to help bridge the gap between the banjo and a more mainstream audience that wasn't familiar with the instrument. Because even though the banjo was America's most popular instrument at the end of the 1800s, which is a crazy thing to think about, mm. even though it had that exalted position in our society then, since then, and I think mostly due to like the convergence of bluegrass music and clear channel radio and network television. Now people think this is an instrument that's just for high speed car chases and, and bank robberies. And obviously the instrument can do a lot more, but I think like I was talking about the three finger style, sometimes being an impediment for people trying to play. I think it is for listeners too, sometimes, because if you play, you know, if you play, uh, I don't know, whatever you're trying to play, I'm trying to think of a tune where it's hard to hear the melody. Uh, a lot of times people will hear the banjo and they'll be like, oh, that's cool, but what's the melody? Like, I don't really get what the melody of that tune is. Um, trying to think of something that would be a good example that's uh, like a bluegrass tune. 
you know. Uh, that sounds super like you want to go rob a bank right now. But what I couldn't sing it to you, back mm -hmm. to you. And so what we thought we'd do is take some cover tunes that people did recognize, like Time After Time or, uh, like you said, Feels So Good, and play them on the banjo so people could not only hear what the melody is, but then hear what was so cool about what the banjo was bringing to the melody. So that was really the goal with that record. And um, I don't know, That's I think that one of our proudest accomplishments as a band is when it's usually the case that the banjo player's wife comes up to us after the show and says, he always drags me to these things, but now I really like the banjo. <laughs> because there's so much to like about this instrument, but there's been so much in its presentation that could really put people off from it, you know, over like the last hundred years. Um, kind of a, a left, left turn here, but um, a few years ago at the, uh, the annual Bluegrass Festival in, in Vista, the headliner was the, uh, the group Della May, who I believe you worked with more recently and intriguingly as part of a tour with uh, Steve Martin and Martin Short. Mm -hmm. um, how did that come about? I've known those girls for a long time, and uh, I think I actually played some banjo on their very first record. So um, how, how did that come about? Um, I think that Steve, you know, the Steep Canyon Rangers have been Steve's band for like the past 10 years. And as their career has grown, they've, they've wanted to step away a little bit from doing the Steve and Marty dates and do some of their own stuff. So, so the show has been in the position of like having a slot for another band here and there. So Steve reached out to me um, about actually about the first ladies of bluegrass to do some shows and they weren't available f at the beginning. And so, I suggested Della May, which actually turned out to be a really great fit because um, otherwise the Stephen Mar Marty show is all a bunch of guys. So it's kind of this nice fresh moment to have like a female band. Mm. But I love Della May and I love playing with those guys and doing those dates, which the first ladies have now done some too with, with Stephen and Marty have been just really fun. I mean, it's amazing to get to see those, you know, those comedic legends do what they do and especially how hard they work at what they do and how they're constantly honing the show. I mean, the show has been that Netflix special that they did is probably three years old. So been doing the show for four or five years, but every night they're wordsmithing it still. Yeah. I, I would think that, that Steve Martin as a banjo player would have been really happy to be on the road with you and be able to uh, pick your, your brain, no pun intended. But I'm wondering, have, have you in turn told a joke to Steve Martin or Martin Short? <laughs> I would never dare to tell a joke to those guys. <laughs> Although Gary's gotten them to laugh a few times when we've been traveling. But mostly it's it's has been really fun to play with Steve. I mean, he loves the banjo. It's completely genuine. And he is a real, you know, disciple of the instrument, too. And he's constantly, just as he's working on the show, I mean, he's really constantly trying to evolve as a musician, too. So it's been exciting we've actually you know been swapping some ideas back and forth for writing some some new music because he's a great um claw hammer banjo player he's one of those unicorns that can do three finger and claw hammer and most mm. people do one or the other but steve does both really well and i love his claw hammer playing so we've been trying to come up with a tune for for three finger and claw hammer in an unlikely event anybody tuned in right now doesn't know what claw hammer means could you quickly oh. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm definitely not one of the unicorns that can do both. Um, claw hammer just means that you put your hand in a like a claw shape. So it's like a much more old time sounding way of playing the banjo, and it actually is a much more old time way of playing mm. the banjo. We had a cameo a moment ago by a black cat. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, we have two cats. I think you just saw a cameo from Finn McCool. Finn McCool. <laughs> well, I'm I'm wondering, Allison, to, to wrap it up, and and it's really been uh, you know a treat for me to be able to to, to talk to you. Um, 
but I'm wondering if we could go out with whatever you feel like playing at the moment and if you could tell us what it is that you're going to be playing. Sure. I mean, I was wondering about the idea of playing a video. Would that be a good thing to do or would you prefer? I thought it might be kind of fun to maybe do a uh, to feature the um, Julia Bell banjo a little bit, because I know you're going to be talking to the Deerings next week. Next week, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm yeah. happy to play uh, play one of those videos. Which which one would you like me to queue up? Well, let's do the girl I left behind. Um, okay. That features the first ladies of bluegrass, and we really got together to do that video to premiere the Julia Bell banjo. So it might be a good segue into. Okay. The and, conversation next week. And that is a perfect note because we are interviewing uh, Jamie Deering, the, the newly appointed CEO of Deering Banjo, uh, Greg and Janet Deering as well, the founders of Deering Banjo. So, yeah, let's take a look at that. Let me get that ready. The girl I left behind. Okay. And bring it up on QuickTime. Here we go. good choice that was amazing um i want to give you both my thanks today thank you allison thank you george for being a part of this ep uh, episode we really um 
we went places where I didn't know we were going to go, and I learned so much. I love every episode we've been doing so far, and this one, just having you both on as guests, um, I mean, it, it really means a lot to us. I hope, I mean, just based upon on the comments, I see everybody had a great time, uh, and it it's it's fantastic. I, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. Any final parting comments from either of you? I just want to say thank you, George. Like I said, it truly is always a pleasure to talk to you. So thank you so much. I hope we get to meet again soon. I look forward to it. Thank you. It was really an honor to be to be invited, and uh, thank you for letting me be part of it. Wonderful. All right. Well, until then, uh, everyone, thank you so much for enjoying uh, another episode of Mom at Home. Uh, we did mention next week we do have Jamie Deering, Janet, and Greg Deering, and we're going to be talking. Uh, we're going to be giving a brief history of the Deering banjo as well as their future too. Um, we're, it's going to be it's a uh, two weeks of banjos. Who would have thought? Uh, so join us for that. Also, we have one of our virtual concerts coming up next Friday, Friday evening. So Friday day, two p.m. Pacific. Join us for the story of the Deering Banjo Company uh, with the Deering family. And then Friday evening, we are selling tickets. We have this is a um, a ticketed event, ten dollars. Come see uh, bassist Michael Kennedy and his band. He's put together. We're live from the museum stage. No audience. Uh, we still. It's too. We're we're still socially distancing. We're doing everything virtual right now, uh, but we're producing it there from the Museum of Making Music, beaming it straight to your homes. Uh, professionally, professional audio, professional sound, and I even have a brand new, ooh, camera switcher. So, um, multi camera setup. Uh, come visit us for Michael Kennedy. You can visit museumofmakingmusic.org for more information, as well as to catch next week's episode of Mom at Home, uh, the virtual concert. And then next, uh, following week, we have Don Lewis, um, electrical engineer, vocalist, uh, multi-instrumentalist. He created the instrument, the Live Electronic Orchestra, which was a predecessor to MIDI. Uh, so he'll be kind of giving a perspective on the history of synthesizers the following week. So that's two weeks. So next week, Deering's live virtual concert uh, in the evening. And then following that, Don Lewis. I do, I would be remiss also, a personal, personal note. Uh, I have to give a shout out. Uh, today is my little brother's birthday. Happy bro- birthday, little brother, uh, David. You know who you are <laughs> thank you and then tomorrow is my dad's birthday happy birthday dad and then happy anniversary to my wife uh, which was yesterday so today is a big week for for the uh for our household uh it's easy to remember all of the events and activities going on because they happen successfully and I, I can rattle them off right then and there until next time everyone take care and thank you for watching <laughs>